Temos um grande honor de apresentar o, o Richard Stallman, estar connosco hoje. Não é qualquer pessoa, é uma pessoa que tem cambiado as nossas vidas. Sem ele, os aparatos eletrónicos que utilizamos hoje não teriam a mesma forma de funcionamento e talvez não funcionariam de, de tudo. E não somente cambiou porque é um brilhante, tem brilhantes é um gênio que tem brilhantes capacidades técnicas, mas também porque tem um pensamento político que nasce dessas capacidades técnicas e uma das principais uh, forças desse pensamento político é a invenção da, da noção de free software, de software livre e a vontade de fazer da internet, uh, do numérico, do digital e do mundo em geral das tecnologias, um espaço de liberdade, não somente para os as empresas, mas sobretudo para os cidadãos. E então essa luta que ele está a levar a cabo há 40 anos faz que tenha uma experiência histórica, uma capacidade técnica e uma mirada sobre o funcionamento do mundo que parecia-nos essencial apresentar no momento em que a maioria dos movimentos de resistência dos quais falamos, que foram invitados durante estes dias, são movimentos que residem sobre, apoiam-se sobre uh, redes sociais, sobre sistemas informáticos que não são livres, que são partícipes do sistema contra o qual estão a lutar, e, esse, e essa paradoxa não somente produz efeitos de tipo moral ou éticos, mas também efeitos práticos na limitação dessas lutas e na, na, na incapacitação dessas lutas para provocar uma emancipação real. Então é com muito prazer que recebemos o Richard. Thank you very much. It's up to you. I couldn't tell what he was saying. I hope what he said was friendly. I don't speak Portuguese. So <clears throat> I'm here to talk about the injustice of the computing systems that people use. Of course, we're aware that some of the computing companies can do evil things. We know that some companies provide support to the U.S. government for deportations. Uh, we know that some companies do surveillance and manipulate elections. But most people are completely unaware that the digital systems and tools that they use are mistreating them systematically and fundamentally. This is a form of subjection a form of digital colonization that people have not become aware of. But this is what I have been fighting against for 35 years. Initially, people did computing by running a program. You'd have a computer, you'd get a program and install it in your computer, and it would do things. The developer would say, here's what this program does. You would install it and it would do those things, usually. And if it didn't do those things, it was usually by accident. Not anybody's fault, we all make mistakes. <clears throat> Nowadays, people sometimes do their computing through online services. If you use an online service, you don't even run the program. The program is running in somebody else's computer and you can never control what it does. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about the difference between software livre and proprietary non-free software. And the first point is, which is which? Is this the way? Oh, I see. This is the way. So when I say free software, I mean livre. I do not mean gratis. I'm not talking about price. Price is a side issue. Whether you pay money to get a copy of a program or receive it as a gift or a business just hands it out without charging, that's a, a, de a minor detail. That's not an important question. 
because we're not against buying and selling. We're concerned with something more fundamental, more morally important. Once you have the program, how does it treat you? Does it respect your freedom or does it crush your freedom and subjugate you? Does it respect your community or does it drive people apart and tear apart your community? These are the important questions. This is what Software Livre is about. So first, what is a program? What is a computer? A computer is a universal computing engine. But really, all it knows how to do is one very simple thing. Get the next instruction and do what that says. And then the next instruction and do what that says. And the next, and the next, and the next. Millions of times per second, it will get an instruction and do what that instruction says. The instructions come from a program, which is simply a collection of instructions. Depending on what instructions are in that particular program, it can make the same computer do this, or that, or that, or that, or that, or that, or that, or an infinity, potentially, of other things. The same computer with the right program could do absolutely any computing job except the impossible ones, which no computer can do. But if we stick to the ones that are possible, the same computer could do any of them with the right program, with the right instructions. So who gives the instructions to your computer? You might think it's you, when really it's someone else. You might think that your computer is obeying you, when really it's obeying its true master all the time. And it does what you want if the true master says okay. But if the true master doesn't like it, you'll find there is no way to tell your computer to do the thing you want. There's simply no word for that. There, with any program, there are two possibilities. Either the users control the program, or the program controls the users. It's always one or the other, because there's no other possibility. When the users control the program, that is free software, software livre. Why so? Well, what is freedom? Freedom is having control of what you do in your life. Control of the activities you do. But if you use a program to do the activity, control of the activity requires control of the program you're using. So when the users control the program, that program respects their freedom and community, so it's free software. I'll explain in a couple of minutes how community fits into this. Practically speaking, in order for users to have control of the program, the program has to give them the four essential freedoms. Now we're getting to the practical criterion for a program which is livre. <clears throat> Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program any way you wish for any purpose. Freedom one is the freedom to study the program's source code and change it so the program runs the way you wish and does your computing the way you wish. Why do we focus on source code? Well, here is some source code. This looks like a mixture of English and math. If you have learned the programming language, you can read the source code and understand it, and then change it to do something a little different or a lot different. But to run it, we convert it into executable code, which is an, an enigmatic series of ones and zeros, which is difficult even for programmers to understand, especially when it gets to be a lot of them. This is still a small program, but you can see it's a lot of complex details, not so easy to figure out what this program actually says. What are the instructions in this program? Well, with a real program, 
which might have a hundred million ones and zeros. The job of figuring out what it does can be painfully hard. So we don't even think of trying except as a last resort in a case of desperation. In order for people to really have the option of changing their programs, they must have the source code of those programs. Freedom One includes that source code is available. <clears throat> These two freedoms together give users separate control of the program. Here are four users using the same program. One of them is exercising Freedom One by changing per copy of the program. I use the singular gender neutral pronouns person, per, and pers. They work grammatically like she, her, and hers, but they do not specify the person's gender. This way I can maintain the distinction between singular and plural, and that makes a lot of sentences much clearer and easier to understand. So this separate control is very useful and it's essential, but it's not enough because most users are not programmers. Most users don't know how to read source code, and why should they? They do other things. They have other talents in life. There are many interesting things to do in life if you're good at them, and programming is just one. So I don't think everybody should have to learn to program, but even the non-programmers deserve control over their own computing lives. How can non-programmers have that? Through collective control, which means the freedom to work with others as a group to exercise control over what the program does. At the top, we see a group of three users working together to change this program. But look, two of them on the right are actually touching the code. They must be programmers. But the third one on the left is not touching the code. Maybe person doesn't know how to program, but is participating in the group's decisions about what changes to make. That's how non-programmers can participate in exercising control over the behavior of the programs they use. And this, it turns out, is crucial to making programs treat users with respect and honesty. Those who cooperate in this way are those who choose to. At the bottom are two more users of the same program, but they are not working with the group. They're just using it separately. And they're free to do either one. Maybe tomorrow they'll all decide to work together. Or maybe they'll decide that what they want is too different and it doesn't make sense practically to cooperate. It's up to all of them. In any case, Collective control of the program depends on two more essential freedoms. Freedom two is the freedom to make exact copies of the program and give or sell them to others when you wish. And freedom three is to make copies of your modified versions of the program and give or sell them to others when you wish. These permit any group to function and cooperate. So if one member of the group makes a modified version, using Freedom 3, person is free to make copies and distribute them to others in the group. But each of them with Freedom 2 is free to make more exact copies of that and distribute those to others in the group. Of course, they also have Freedom 3. They could make their own changes as if they wish. So this way, everyone in the group can get a copy. But the group does not have to have any formal existence. It doesn't have to have a list of members. Whichever people are cooperating, that's a group. So freedoms three and two do not restrict who you can distribute copies to. You can redistribute, you know, give or sell copies to anyone in the world. You can even offer copies to the general public, which means publishing that version. Anyone who gets a copy is free to do so. This is what free software means you're allowed to do. So uh, 
if the program comes with these four essential freedoms, then the users control the program, both separately and collectively, in parallel. So this program respects the user's freedom and their community and its free software. And since the four essential freedoms are fundamental, I'll repeat them. Freedom zero, to run the program any way you wish for any purpose. Freedom one is the freedom to study the program source code and change it so that it runs in the way you wish. Freedom two is to make exact copies and give or sell them to others when you wish. And freedom three is to make copies of your modified versions, if you have made any modified versions, and then give or sell them to others when you wish. If one of these freedoms is missing or incomplete, insufficient, then the program is not free software because it doesn't respect the user's freedom and community. It is not under the control of the program, of the, of the users. Instead, the program controls the users. A non-free program controls the users and the owner controls the program. So this non-free program, precisely because it is non-free, generates a system of unjust power, power for the company over the users. And this is purely simply because the program doesn't respect the user's freedom. I've used an example of a giant company, but it doesn't matter if the company is big or small. No matter what company it is that owns this non-free program, no matter how many or how few users there are, the company has power over the users, and this is an injustice. So people often talk about monopolies or quasi-monopolies for these software companies. Well, monopoly is a dangerous thing, but if instead of Microsoft we had 10 different companies making 10 different non-free programs to do the same job, I would say no to all of them because none of them should have power over me or over you. If you have a choice between non-free programs, that means you can choose who is your master. Freedom means not having a master. If we want to be in control of our computing lives, We've got to stop anyone else from controlling our computing lives. We've got to escape from non-free software. So this is the fundamental injustice inherent in any non-free program. But typically it leads to other injustices because the owner has power over people and power corrupts. The owner feels the temptation to put malicious functionalities into the software. And nowadays, it's normal for non-free programs to have malicious functionalities. For instance, spying on people. You've probably heard of the Amazon Kindle. I call it the Amazon Swindle uh, because it swindles readers out of the traditional freedoms of readers of books. For instance, it reports what users are doing. It reports what the user is reading. It reports which page the user is reading. If the user enters any notes or highlights any text, that's all reported to Amazon. But spying on the user is standard practice in non-free software today. The five main non-free operating systems I'm talking about Windows, Mac OS, Android, iOS, and Chrome OS, all spy on the user. And most apps also spy on the user, according to research. Uh, and of course, you shouldn't tolerate that a computing system spies on you. We should rise up and put an end to the use of those systems. And I've been doing my best to rise up for 35 years. Uh, the Fitbit is really outrageous. 
It's there to keep track of your running and your exercise. But it was set up so that it wouldn't offer the data directly to the user. No, the user was supposed to upload the data to the manufacturer's server, and then the manufacturer would sell the user, sell the data to the user the data is about. What nerve? Well, if you hear someone talking about the Internet of Things, it usually means that it's designed to work that way. When the user wants to give a command to the product or get any information from the product, it has to go through the manufacturer's server, which means the manufacturer spies on everything and controls everything. There's even a sex toy that works this way. It's designed so someone else can send commands but those commands go through the manufacturer's server. So the manufacturer is spying on all the lovers that are using this in, as couples. Well, that's vicious. They shouldn't be allowed to know what users are doing with their products. It should be illegal to design these programs to spy on people. They should, it should be required to design them in ways where the manufacturer can't spy and neither can anyone else. In addition, occasionally the company says, we're not making enough money from that old product. Let's switch off the server and all the products break. But this has happened many times. Then there is digital restrictions management or DRM. That's when the system is designed to, re to restrict the users, to refuse to do certain things or refuse to do them for certain people. And here you can see that instead of your servant, that program is your prison guard, your jailer. So I refuse to use any system with DRM unless I can break the DRM. If it was designed to restrict me, then unless I know how to defeat the restrictions, I reject it totally. I won't use it at all. I've never used a Blu-ray disc because I don't have free software that can break the digital handcuffs in the Blu-ray disc. So as far as I'm concerned, the disc is not there. I, would, I will not trade my freedom for all the movies in the world And then there are back doors. A back door is when they can send a command remotely to your computer and tell it to do something whether you like it or not. The Amazon swindle has a back door to erase books. We found this out in 2009. Amazon erased thousands of copies of a particular book. Which book can you guess? It was 1984 by George Orwell. And this is how we learned that the system had the ability to erase books. It would have been even nicer, to, I suppose, more ironic if it could burn the books. Now imagine a driverless taxi with a back door. Imagine if someone could send a command to the taxi telling it to take you to secret police headquarters or the torture center with the doors locked and not let you open them. You can't trust a driverless taxi if it has any way of knowing who the passenger is. If it's your own car and it's driverless, then you could trust it if the car has no connection to anyone, if there's no way for anyone to send it a command or to upgrade the software. Really what you want though is all the software in the car should be free. And I'm sure the US would do this. I expect Saudi Arabia would do this. They'd probably build a saw into every taxi so that the passenger could arrive pre-dismembered. 
China, of course, would do this. Uh, then there is censorship. Apple invented censorship of apps. The iPhone was the first generally useful computer, could do many different things, where users were not permitted to install their choice of apps. They could only install the apps that Apple approved. And Apple practices censorship for China. Recently, Apple banned an app that had been made to help protesters in Hong Kong coordinate. And China ordered Apple to block that app, and Apple did. By the way, there's also a back door. Apple can erase the app even if it's already installed. And uh, Windows has a universal back door, meaning that Microsoft can remotely change the code, which means it can do absolutely any nasty thing to the machine that has Windows running in it. This was first discovered in Windows XP. Nowadays, Microsoft admits that it has this backdoor, but uses a nice sounding name. It's called Auto Upgrade. Or if you don't like the change, you might decide that Auto Downgrade is a more fitting term. But in any case, this should not exist. It's an injustice. In any case, uh, these are a few examples, but almost everyone that uses non-free software uses these. So we know almost everyone that is using proprietary, that is non-free software, is already a victim of proprietary malware. And uh, <clears throat> basically, in principle, a program can be free or non-free, and it can be honest or malware, and they're theoretically independent. But in practice, they go together. Free programs are almost always honest, and non-free programs are usually malware. Why is this? There's a systematic reason because the developers of non-free software have power over the user. That power corrupts them, so they put in non-free, they put in malicious functionalities in order to profit more. And they know that whatever they put in, the users cannot remove it. The users are stuck. But we developers of, so basically the only way to trust a non-free program is with blind faith. You have to make an effort to forget that that company has mistreated you before, mistreated millions of people before, perhaps, and just believe, well, this time I can trust it, right? Blind faith. But with free software, you can have rational trust because you know that the user community controls that program. The user community can make that program honest. The user community can look for anything that is bad. Of course, it's the programmers who do that. But when they find something, if they find something bad, and they release an improved version which doesn't have the bad thing, that protects you, even if you don't know any programming. That corrected version will be circulated in the community, and eventually that's the one you will get. So because the user community can protect itself, what that means is that the programmers in the community can protect everyone else in the community. We're not helplessly at the mercy of some company that owns the program. And this is what, de what deters free software developers from putting in anything nasty in the first place. Because you've got to expect that users will, will notice it and they'll fix it. We don't have power. That saves us from being corrupted. So you've got to recognize that a non-free program was meant to subjugate you and then mistreat you. It's an opportunity to be swindled. Don't 
accept it. You should come to the free world that we have built and live with us in freedom. We built it with the GNU operating system and the kernel Linux, which worked together. I started GNU in 1984, almost 36 years ago now. And uh, Linux was started in 1991. And Linux filled the last gap in GNU. So now you can use the GNU system with Linux as kernel. It's also called the GNU slash Linux system. Many people mistakenly call the system Linux, and they're giving us no credit at all. Please don't do that. Please give us equal mention. We started it. I think we deserve equal mention. So uh, there's a lot I will have to skip. But uh, I should point out that nowadays, a lot of digital systems surveil the users. We suffer from more surveillance than the Soviet Union. And this is extremely dangerous. And not just in the ways people usually think of. Yes, Facebook uses this to manipulate elections or to let the rich manipulate elections. Uh, and we've got to put an end to that. But simply keeping track of what people do is dangerous even if it's not used to manipulate elections. So if we look at the whole set of surveillance data, it's a lot of stuff, but it's collected by various different systems. In some cases through non-free programs, in some cases through services. Uh, but, and so it ends up in these different databases. But then they sell this data to data brokers. And so the data brokers put it all together into one effectively big database. Sometimes the data brokers get databases in anonymized form, meaning your name and your address and your uh, ID number are not there. But it turns out it's usually easy to figure out who the person is, so they do that. And so they put together one giant surveillance database. And in addition, in, governments do that. In the US, the FBI can simply demand a copy of these databases. It doesn't even have to give a reason, and it's done secretly, so you can't tell that the FBI has demanded the copies of a 1,000 databases that have information about you. I'm guessing. I don't know if it's a 1,000. Maybe it's only 200. Maybe it's 10,000. We're not allowed to know. But we can be confident that the FBI gets all this data and puts it into one giant database. This is tremendously dangerous. It's dangerous for democracy. You see, some people are heroes. Some people are whistleblowers who reveal to the public crimes that the government is committing. For instance, Chelsea Manning, for instance, Edward Snowden, reveal to, have revealed to us crimes that the US government was committing. Well, the government likes to keep those crimes secret, and so it calls the whistleblowers uh, spies or traitors or whatever. And so it wants to find them. And if it finds them, it will destroy them. So how does it find them? Well, if the government records who goes where and what person does there and who person talks with, then it can almost always identify the whistleblower just from that. And if it catches all the whistleblowers, it'll be so frightening we won't have whistleblowers. We won't find out about crimes committed, either whether they're war crimes or crimes against democracy. We won't find out. So if we want to find out, 
we must ensure that those, those things are not collected. We must make, make sure it is possible to communicate with people and travel to talk with people without be tracked. That's why I say this, don't be tracked, pay cash. I never buy things with anything but cash. I go to a physical store and I hand over cash. That's the only way I do it because it's my duty to defend democracy by fighting against all systems to track what people buy. Tracking what people buy gives a lot of insight into their lives and their movements. This is why I insist on paying for the bus or the train anonymously because the state must not be allowed to monitor people's movements. We have to learn that that is the prerequisite for democracy, making it sure people can communicate privately, that the, making sure that the government can't tell, can't identify the whistleblower by asking, who talked with this journalist in the past six months? Because that's what the US government does. It gets the full communication records of the journalists who might have been involved. And then it says, who in that agency talked with one of these journalists? People have been put in prison by this. So if we want democracy, we must protect whistleblowers. We must facilitate whistleblowing and that means we must not allow systems to collect this, these data. These data, who talked with whom, who went where, and what did that person do there, these data must not be collected except uh, when a court gives a specific order, you can start following that person now. And that should only be given when there's some evidence of a crime to justify a court order to investigate someone. You have to show evidence of a crime. We must give up on the foolish, inadequate approach of the GDPR, which tries to limit the commercial use of the data already collected. That's totally inadequate. It can't ever do the job. We must go much further. We must forbid systems from collecting data. We must have laws saying, if it is possible to do this job without identifying people, even if it's not quite as efficient, you must do it without identifying people. There are cities in Europe where if you park a car, you have to enter the license plate number in a machine. Well, that's a system of massive surveillance of people's movements. It should be absolutely forbidden. We know it's possible to charge for parking without identifying people. Therefore, the law must say, you may not identify the people or the, the cars, which identifies the people anyway. Uh, you must use the anonymous methods, and only the anonymous methods, to collect that money. Anyway, some people propose to break up these companies into pieces. Well, then we'd have more separate databases at the beginning, but they would still go to the data brokers that would combine them, and the FBI would still combine them. So breaking up the companies won't protect us from data collection. It might be useful, it might reduce their lobbying power. That would be a step forward. But this is not the way to protect us from dangerous surveillance. We have to forbid the surveillance. So uh, I should mention, many of you have heard of something called open source. Well, that is a corporate friendly co-optation campaign to depoliticize free software. As you can tell, the idea of free software, 
the free software movement, campaigns for people's freedom, for human rights that have not been recognized but ought to be. Well, that struck people as too radical, some people. So they decided to s separate our software from uh, the ideas behind our software. They started calling the programs open source, which doesn't mention freedom, doesn't even hint at freedom. So they developed a different discourse, a different philosophy that doesn't present the issue as a matter of justice or injustice, as a matter of freedom people deserve, as a matter of right or wrong. It just talks about the practical convenience when you can change the programs you're using. It is convenient. What they're saying is not wrong, but it's implicitly legitimizing the programs that subjugate people, and that's what's wrong. So this is why I never advocate open source. I stand for software livery, and if you care about these freedoms, you can show that by refusing to talk about open source. You can do what I do, insist on talking about software livery. Another thing you can do, well, we have some things for sale outside. For instance, this button that says, ask me about free software, it costs four euros. This little button with a GNU head is two euros. We've got various other products out there. We also have a lot of stickers which are gratis. If you can put one sticker to good use, please take one. If you can put 10 stickers to good use, please take 10. If you can put 40 stickers to good use, please take 40 and use them. Put them up where people will see them. So, um, schools should teach exclusively free software because schools have a social mission to educate good citizens of a society that is strong, capable, independent, cooperating, and free. In the computing field, that means teaching people to be capable users of free software and ready to live in such a society. And you should never teach students to use a non-free program because that implants dependence in the future of society. It's like teaching them to smoke tobacco. Never. It should be forbidden for schools to ever teach the use of a non-free program. And I mean any level of school from kindergarten to university. And when I say teach, I mean anything that leads the students to use a particular program. They should always be leading students to be citizens of a free society, never teaching dependence. But in addition, there is moral education. We need to teach students to, uh, to cooperate with each other, to help each other. But what does non-free software teach? It teaches never share. If you share, you're a pirate. They're saying that helping other people is the moral equivalent of attacking ships. Well, I say that's false. So let's not call those people pirates. Let's call them good members of their community. So every class should have this rule. Students, if you bring a program to class, you may not keep it for yourself. You must share copies with the rest of the class, including source code in case someone wants to here wants to learn, because this class is a place where we share our knowledge. Therefore, it is not permitted to bring a non-free program to this class, except to do reverse engineering, which means figuring out how it works so we can learn. But the school has to follow its own rule to set a good example. It must bring only free programs to class and offer copies, including source code, to everyone in the class that wants a copy. Human rights depend on each other. If you lose one human right, it becomes harder to defend the other human rights. Now that we do so many important things with 
software and digital systems, free software, which is, more broadly means control of your computing activities, is one of the human rights we must defend so that we can defend the other human rights. And that sometimes means you've got to make a sacrifice. If you want to keep your freedom, you have to say, no, I won't use that system. I will go to tremendous lengths to refuse to use non-free software, refuse to identify myself. Of course, there's some places where it's legitimate to ask you to identify yourself. Dealing with your bank, yes, you should identify yourself. We don't want someone else to be able to steal the money from your bank account. But there are many other situations where no one has any legitimate reason to want to know who you are. Uh, we should fight against systems for buying things, for paying for transportation, for making a phone call when you're in the middle of the street, which require identifying yourself, because that's dangerous. Now, there are many kinds of systems that surveil people nowadays. It's not just non-free programs running on your computer like Windows or Mac OS or Android. They do so, but it's not just that. It's not just all the digital payment systems. We have developed an anonymous digital payment system. We should campaign for that to replace the, uh, the systems that identify the purchaser. Our system is called Taler.net. It's T-A-L-E-R. Dot net. And uh, also, uh, if you're using a phone, a mobile phone, its location is tracked all the time, and it can be remotely converted into a listening device. The, every mobile phone has some non-free software in it that communicates with the radio. And this program has a universal back door so they can replace it with a different program silently. And you might not even notice that any change was made, but the replacement program listens and transmits all the time. And it never really turns off. If you ask it to switch off, <coughs> It is programmed to pretend to switch off, but it doesn't really switch off. So it continues running, listening, and transmitting. So I call the mobile phone Stalin's dream. And I don't have one. I feel that no matter how convenient it might be, it's my duty as a citizen to fight against Stalin's dream, so I don't have one. I do use mobile phones. I use lots of different mobile phones. If I need to make a call, if I want to say, the bus will arrive in 40 minutes, I ask someone else on the bus, will you please make a call for me? That way I can tell my, my friend, or will you please send a text for me? And that way, Big Brother doesn't know it's me. Remember. I bought a ticket anonymously, too. I hope Big Brother doesn't know that I'm on that bus. Big Br the state has no right to know who's on the bus. It should never know. But, of course, the danger of face recognition is hard to resist. And, you know, it's interesting that several countries have made it a crime to cover your face in public. They present this as a way of persecuting Muslim women. But I say it's not just Muslim women who deserve not to be tracked in their movements. We all deserve this. We all deserve the right to cover our faces so that we can't be tracked. But it would be much nicer if we had governments that did not permit systems that would identify us in the street, so that we could be sure we were not being tracked anyway. So for more information about surveillance, look at gnu.org slash philosophy slash 
surveillancevsdemocracy.html. For more information about why software should be free, look at gnu.org slash philosophy slash free software even more important dot html. And in general, look at gnu.org for information about the GNU operating system and the free software movement. And you can also help us. You can do work for the cause by writing free software if you're a talented programmer. But there are other things you can do that don't require any technical skill. You can organize to campaign. You know, this is a political movement that needs organizing like any other political movement. You can persuade schools and governments to move to free software. Nowadays, schools make students run non-free software that spies on them to companies. Now, this should be a crime. Any school administrators that permit this to go on should be prosecuted. You can help other users if you become an expert at using the GNU system. Helping other users learn to use it is a good thing to do, too. Uh, and just saying software livre instead of open source shows your support for our cause. But there are so many other things you can do, there's no room for them. So look at gnu.org slash help and you'll see many other kinds of volunteer work that we need. So now it's time for the auction. This is an adorable GNU that needs a home. So I'm going to auction it for the benefit of the Free Software Foundation. If you buy it, I can sign it for you. If you have a penguin at home, a penguin is the symbol of Linux, then you need a GNU for your penguin. There should never be a penguin without a GNU. <clears throat> so uh, it, we can accept payments in cash or with a bank card or with Bitcoin if you have something here to make the payment with. The, for a bank card, it's got to be one that can make international purchases by phone because that's effectively how this is going to work. Uh, is there an, a bank machine near here? There is. So you could bid and then you can go out to the bank machine and come back with the cash. It's always better for your privacy to get money, get cash out of the bank machine and pay cash than to pay with a card directly to a merchant because if you just get the cash, the system doesn't know what you bought. So it is partly protecting your privacy to go to the bank machine instead. So anyway, uh, I'm going to start with the usual price of 25 euros. Please speak loud, I have hearing problems. So, do I get 25 euros for this adorable GNU? 25 euros, anyone, for this adorable GNU? No bids? I'll bid. How much? How about 30? I've got 30 euros. Do I get 35? How much? 40. 40. I've got 40. Do I get 45 for this adorable GNU? Do I get 45 euros for this adorable GNU? For, how much? Who? I've got 45. Do I get 50? Do I get 50? 50 euros to the Free Software Foundation to defend your freedom? Last chance to bid 50 euros or more for this adorable GNU. Last chance. How much? I've got 50, do I get 55? Do I get 55 euros for this adorable GNU? 55 to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom. Last chance to bid 55 or more for this GNU. Last chance, go, how much? 
60. I've got 60. Do I get 65 euros for this adorable GNU? 65 to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom. Last chance to bid 65 or more. Last chance. Going. Going. Gone for 60. I'll see you later for the payment. Return. Now, this is an adorable book <laughs> that needs a home. This is my book of essays, Free Software, Free Society. Uh, it's in English, and I'm going to do it the same way. Uh, do I get uh, 25 euros for this adorable book? I can't see anything. Turn that off. Turn that light off. I can't see the audience. Thank you. 30. I've got 30. Do I get 35? 35 euros for this adorable book. Last chance to bid 35 or more for this adorable book. Going, going, gone for 30. Please come up and pay. <laughs> Meanwhile, this is, an this is another adorable book. This is my semi-autobiography uh, in French. And uh, I'm going to do the same thing. Do I get 25 euros for this adorable book? Which is also a fan. 25 euros for this adorable book. Last chance to bid 25 euros or more for this adorable book. There's one book. there, at the end, there's one there. Is who, someone, where? Yeah. Please wave your arm. Okay, how much do you bid? Do, okay, do I get 30 euros for this adorable book? I've got 25, do I get 30? How much? I've got 30, do I get 35? Do I get 35 for this adorable book? Last chance to bid 35 or more. Last chance, going, going, gone for 30. So you also, please come up and pay, or you can do it at the end. So my first question was, uh, as you know, social networks, um, need to reach very quickly a certain mass of users in order to impose themselves to other social networks. I understand. They're competing using the network effect. But if the social network is an injustice, then you, sh you just shouldn't use it. No, yes. So my question is, I mean, the ecosystem seems to require to reach that no, mass. No, it doesn't. Okay. It only requires that if you're a business and you're determined to make money by mistreating the people who are on the network. This is why I say that Facebook does not have users. It has useds. So, because my question is how, like, I don't know if you think that building alternatives. We have alternatives. You can use them. And they have more than a handful of, of users. So, for example, Mastodon, uh, maybe you think yeah. of it. Uh, so is one of the solutions... Well, there are the free social networks I know of include Diaspora, GNU Social, or Mastodon, they're related. Uh, there's also GNU Jammy, mm -hmm. which is for communicating anonymously encrypted. And can, like, do you think that portability of data is an answer or is it a false it's, answer? It's, uh, it's not enough. Por the idea of portability of data is meaningful for a particular scenario. So portability of data in two seconds, can you tell the audience? It maybe? means if you put some data into a service, that means portability of data means you can get the data out in a structured fashion so that you could have a program manipulate the structure and you could put it into a different service to do the same job for you. Well, this is only meaningful when the job that the service does consists of doing some computing on your data. And there are some services like that. Uh, the data should be transmitted in and out in a standard format or at least a documented format so that 
programmers can see how to convert that data to put it into some other service. But most services are not like that. You know, uh, social networks, well, a social network doesn't exist so that you could take a bunch of data and put it in and tell it to do some computing on that data. That's not the job of a social network. It's a different kind of job. So the idea of data portability sort of makes no sense. Not only that, if you look at the example of Facebook, what data does Facebook keep about each Zucker? That's what the users of the youths of Facebook are called. They're Zuckers. Uh, so it keeps the data that that used has put in, but it also keeps a lot of other data which consists of deductions. You know, this person likes a certain song and a certain movie, so probably person is gay. Okay, Th those are did it. It does machine learning, figures out these probable rules, and then it reaches deductions about each Zucker. But those are not part of the Zucker's data, and when people ask for their data from Facebook, they don't get any of that. Is there a way to structurally tr transfer this data, or the nature of the... I think it's irrelevant. The important thing is nobody should know it. So you, we shouldn't create a free f Facebook, it makes no it's, sense. It's, well, the, t the distinction between <coughs> livre and proprietary, that makes sense for a program. More generally, that makes sense for a work. Now, what is a work? It's a, a particular s series of information which can be copied. So a book can be copied, a, a recording of music can be copied, a program can be copied. If I write a program and release it, well then you can copy it. You could each have a copy of the same program. Then, if you wish, you could change it. It's possible to do that. Uh, with proprietary software, they say you're not allowed, but it's basically possible to do it. But that doesn't make sense for a service. You can't copy a service. There are no copiers, just as there are no copiers for tables and chairs and shoes and shirts. There are no copiers for these things. Most of the things we use, the physical objects we use in our lives, have no copiers. Uh, and copying is not a meaningful thing for individuals to do. How could you copy that microphone, right? Even if it's allowed, you still can't do it. Uh, so the things that distinguish a free program or a free song or a free cookbook or a free encyclopedia from a non-free one, they don't even make any sense for services. They're questions that don't mean anything. Uh, the only thing you know that the owner of a service is going to control what it does. So the only way you can trust it is if you know it has no capability to mistreat you. The only way you can trust it with your data is by not giving it data. So if the service lets you use it anonymously such that it can't tell that you are the same person who did something else yesterday, then you can trust it. But how do we make sure of that? It's because of the interface between your computer and the service. If, the, if that interface does not give the service the ability to recognize people, then it's safe. And if, it want, if they want to charge for using the service, well, with an anonymous payment system like GNU Tyler, then you could pay anonymously each time you use it and they wouldn't know that you were the same person who paid for something else the other day. So the, the free software movement needs in a sense an avant-garde which is intermediating between the software and the users that have not the technical capacity to know if the software is actually respecting them. And right. And they depend on the on on and the users depend on the existence of these. But account. anybody can become part of that. It's you just have to learn to program and start reading the code of free programs and reporting bugs. And in terms of accessibility, accessibility. When you say anyone, is it really true that at any age, with any condition, you you are capable of? Uh, Maybe not. 
but the point is some people are going to be better at, at things than other and people. How, how you know, anyone can be a cook, but that doesn't mean you have the talent or I have the talent to be a great chef. And how do users who are illiterate in terms of computer programming and so forth uh, are sure that the avant-garde will not betray them in a way or another? Because they'd be betraying themselves and each other. You have a community of people who use a certain program. They don't want it to spy on them. And some of those people are programmers and they study the code of this program because they noticed a, a bug. They want to fix the bug. They want to make the program do that job correctly. So they study it, and uh, then they work together to f make a corrected version of that program. Well, in the process, some of them have to read the source code, parts of the source code, and they might notice something malicious. If there's something malicious, it's in the source code somewhere. Well, if those people who use the pro this program notice anything malicious, they're going to fix it because it would be treating them wrong. They're just users, you see. They're, they don't control this program in some way. If the program is profiting someone, they aren't the people who are being profited. Uh, you know, a malicious functionality in the program is bad for them just as it's bad for you. So if they notice it, they'll fix it. And in the process, of course, they'll announce, look at the nasty thing we found in that program. And all the redistributors will switch to the corrected version because they all have the interest to do so. And so if we take a step forward, the technical the dimension in which I think it is quite clear, uh, we've seen uh, apparatus of power infiltrating or attempting to infiltrate this functioning, as for example, Jacob Applebaum to told us yesterday regarding his work at Tor, which is supposed to help people um, um, navigate uh, anonymously on the internet. Well, and it does, and I use it for that. But remember, but just, he was just trying to, give to help... The, uh, the audience... Yeah, yeah, he was trying to help specific people, <coughs> namely dissidents living in dictatorships, <coughs> people who might be killed if they were identified, and indeed, uh, they could be betrayed, and some have been. Now, I'm not a dissident living in a dictatorship. What I do is not persecuted. Uh, I offer the same advice to the U.S. government for the same good reasons as I offer to you. We, in fact, are having some influence in U.S. government agencies and helping them avoid being subjugated by businesses. Every government should do this, just as every company should do this, and every organization should do this, and every person should do this. So the point is, the U.S. government doesn't consider me an enemy. So they, the, don't even yeah. bought, they don't even ask to search my computer when I go into the country. So the reason I ask you this question is because good technique or good technical solutions which are politicized in the technical dimension can be used by bad political actors. Yes, they so, can. And for but that's a, di that's a different question. Of course, like that's why I'm trying to... Yeah. I know, but I'd like to finish the previous one yes. and then get to this yeah. one. You see, so I use Tor simply because I don't want companies to track my location when I'm communicating over the net. And Tor does that fine for me. Now, if the NSA or the CIA wanted to find me, I suppose it could, but I have no reason to think that they care. But I do know that lots of companies would like to fill up a database about my movements and travel, and I don't want them to do that. So for my need, Tor, seems to work just fine as far as I can tell. As long as you are not uh, yeah, targeted as politically by a exactly, government. Exactly, exactly. So a tool that can give most of us adequate privacy about our movements may not be enough for a dissident in Egypt or a whistleblower in the US, who knows? And on the other hand, uh, we've seen uh, emancipation movements, very important emancipation movements, rely heavily on platforms like Facebook, like uh, Twitter and so forth, which are designed to collect their data for, right. for, for commercial reasons, but which also actually work as concentrators of data, which yeah. can be then used by governments 
to spy That's on right. them. So, so the point is, but they never pretended to protect people's privacy. <coughs> they never pretended that they didn't surveil. Facebook is all about surveillance. So the question I'm asking myself, and I don't know, do you consider it as paradoxical? And is there a paradox that, is it a paradox that you can solve? Because as we know... I don't have a solution for that. Uh, Facebook does, but you see, I'm not talking about that particular issue, not directly. No. What I say relates to it, but I am pointing out a form of oppression that you weren't even thinking about, that you hadn't even noticed. Now, this doesn't deny the other kinds of oppression that you're aware of. Of course, they're wrong too. But the, what's, it's, you know, it's like when people started pointing out the danger of seed companies and the power they have over farmers. Well, when I first heard that, it had never occurred to me that there was a problem. But yes, it's a problem. Well, okay, I'm doing the same kind of thing. I'm telling you that uh, companies that control the software you use are dangerous, just as companies that control the seeds you plant are dangerous. So you leave up to the individuals and citizens the decision, because, for example... Well, I have no choice about that. No, of I course, can't no, tell but, anyone what to do. No, but prescriptively, in the sense that, for example, an Algerian person who tries now to mobilize it's himself or herself in the, in the movement needs to go through Facebook and WhatsApp I today. don't know what they need to do. I do know that I wouldn't use either of those if I... Even, WhatsApp is another another tech yes. tentacle of Facebook. I so won't. even though if, if you see yourself in an authoritarian regime as the Algerian, is it a, a measure to get into this network to at least I know how to mobilize, it. even I in these circumstances. It. I won't do it at all. So how, that's, I come back to this question, how to do to, to, to participate in this? I don't know. I'm not Algerian. I don't <laughs> live there. And I'm not going to try to to pronounce upon recommendations for people in situations I don't know. But we don't have, so technically we don't have alternatives yet. Well, yes, you do. There are lots of free social networks. You can connect through Tor to networks that maybe the, you know, to, that the Algerian government probably can't spy on. The U.S. government maybe can, but I don't think the U.S. government is particularly a friend of the Algerian government, is it? I don't know. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> but in, in the past, it wasn't particularly. So the thing is, I don't know about situations like that. I'm pointing out that all of us face oppression through the digital systems that subjugate their users or spy on them, restrict them, and mistreat them in various ways. This is another part of the political situation that people have ignored completely. Yes. And now, I've dedicated myself to this particular form of injustice. I try to fight against other injustices too on the side, but there I'm a helper. I'm one of the millions who tr support those other causes. So I think it leaves a question for us, an ex extraordinarily important question is how to combine this, the emancipation from this oppression you speak about and how to still be able to organize massively movements of emancipation in countries that are suffering well, from is, political pressure. You know, uh, I don't know how it is that they let people continue to communicate dissent through Facebook. Why don't they block those Facebook pages? I, have, I don't know. I have, I have a suggestion. I think uh, in France, for example, the, the yellow uh, vests and not yellow jackets uh, massively organize themselves through Facebook. But more importantly, Facebook seemed to push their content because they were, it was very viral content because it uh, relied on... I don't on like the word content when you're talking about people's statements or works or... So the it says it's videos, a statements and, and yeah. so forth. And probably because it, it triggered very uh, raw emotions on people which actually pushed them to share them and therefore maintain them in the platform in order for Facebook right, to make yes. profits. And in the US, Facebook does that with Nazis. And, and Facebook doesn't care if it triggers a revolution yeah. in Algeria, in France, because of its 
because it is looking for profit. Yeah, and, exactly. And so it doesn't care actually for the actual content of the of the statements. Yes, of the exactly. It doesn't it doesn't care which cause it is. But do note that Facebook gets its money mainly by selling targeted ads. So if the viral messages are messages that enable people with money to sell targeted ads, those are the ones that are going to be promoted most on Facebook. And that's why uh, more or less right-wing messages tend to get promoted mainly on Facebook. In the U.S., for example. In well, e everywhere <laughs> generally, not just in the U.S. Uh, I don't know whether it is an accidental byproduct that uh, Rebellion in Algeria got promoted, or maybe they want to open up the Algerian market more to political manipulation by the plutocrats. We'll speak about it. Uh, but by the, the way, yes. since the question of globalization came up in a previous panel, I have a conclusion about globalization, which is you should always ask globalization of what? Because many different human activities can be globalized. And I came to the general conclusion that if something is good, globalizing it makes it better. But if something is evil, globalizing it makes it worse. When we talk about globalization, it usually refers to globalization of the power of business, globalization of plutocracy. Well, the power of business is an injustice. Plutocracy is an injustice. So globalizing it makes it worse. However, we also have scientific cooperation, the globalization of humanity's search for knowledge. Well, globalizing that is good. We have globalization of, of uh, dissent and resistance to plutocracy. I think that's good. Why not globalize it? In fact, that's what we're doing here. So uh, let's be careful and not to say that globalization in the abstract is good or bad, but instead ask, what is being globalized here? Thank you very much, Richard, for being with us. We're going to continue now with the debate on the Mediterranean Sea. It's an extremely important one. I'm sorry we, ha we have very little time, but maybe Richard will, I mean, you will be able to interact outside. Yeah, outside. The, outside. While I sell the merchandise. <laughs> and meanwhile, so, those, uh, those who have uh, won the auctions should please come and see me outside. Muito obrigado, Richard Stadman.